I want to welcome you to the second in a series called Religion and Religion, sponsored by the Berkeley Center for Peace, uh, for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs at Georgetown. Some of you are here for a second visit, and we welcome you back. Last time we had Professor Blinnebaum, and others of you, this may be the first time, but you've seen the brochures. There are three more of these sessions this semester with Dennis McManus and Christos Ockweiss and Peter Fan. Today we're very privileged to have, oh, I, by the way, I'm Chester Gillis, and I'm a senior fellow at the Berkeley Center, so you know who I am. And the director of the Berkeley Center, Tom Bantrop, the mayor himself, is actually here. So hey, Tom. Have a great time, Tom. But our guest of honor and our speaker is John Borelli, known to many of us who've been around Georgetown for a while and known nationally and internationally. Mm -hmm. After teaching history of religions and theology for 12 years at the college and university levels, John Borelli accepted a position in ecumenical and interreligious relations for the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, where he served for more than 16 years. During that time, he staffed ongoing Anglican Catholic, Orthodox Christian Catholic, Muslim Catholic, Buddhist Catholic, Hindu Catholic dialogue, and participated in a wide range of ecumenical and interreligious activities and events. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, I wanted to make clear in my title that my presentation at this lunchtime series, Religion and Religions, is about dialogue and mission. The locus of my paper is Catholic teaching on mission and dialogue, and where the relationship between these two topics continue to play out, as it has done since the time of the Second Vatican Council, when the bishops of the Catholic Church placed mission and dialogue in the public forum and their relationship. Now, I have returned to this topic <coughs> on one which I have followed from the 1980s to the present. At certain points, I have sought to explain are attempted to explain a consistent relationship between current Catholic teaching on dialogue, particularly interreligious dialogue, as it relates to Catholic teaching on mission. I co-facilitated an ecumenical consultation on mission and dialogue, which met twice at the Ecumenical Institute in Collegeville, Minnesota, associated with St. John's University. The consultation was entitled, Confessing Christian Faith in a Pluralistic Society. And that's the title of the report that it was issued after the second meeting in 1995. Christians from a variety of churches and perspectives, historic Protestant, Anglican, Orthodox, Catholic, and Evangelical, including those who worked primarily in mission studies and those who promoted dialogue, sought to lay out the issues and what we came up with on in some areas we concurred but there was a lot of diversity in how various churches approach this topic of mission and dialogue catholics thought they had reached by then a somewhat um how do i how do i somewhat less than satisfactory but sufficiently balanced position for interreligious dialogue which is described as one of among several activities including under, included under the heading of evangelization, somewhat broadly defined to encompass as well traditional missionary activities, such as proclamation of the gospel and establishing missionary structures, establishing churches. Um, this was less than satisfactory because even the broad term evangelization continued to evoke negative reactions among Muslims, Jews, Hindus, and Buddhists, and traditionally traditional peoples, native peoples. This reaction to missionary activity, which you know, came in the wake of the uh, colonialization of the world by the Western powers. This. The missionaries accompanied them. And so there was still a lot of negative reaction. But this, this consensus that we had was still unsatisfactory because various persons within the Catholic Church, various authorities, would interpret it in different ways and emphasize different points. 
And so at times it seemed as though we were speaking out, out of two sides of our mouth, promoting traditional missionary activity and promoting interreligious dialogue. Then, in the year 2000, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith issued the Declaration Dominus Jesus on the unicity and salvific universality of Jesus Christ and the Church. And I was once again writing and reflecting on mission and dialogue. And I produced a chapter in a volume edited by Thomas Rausch, a Jesuit out of California at Loyola Marymount. My chapter was Interreligious Dialogue and Mission, Continuing Questions. My final two sentences were these. As Christians seek language to explain this relationship between dialogue and mission, they also know that they are exploring areas of human relations that are largely unchartered. Theological judgment, judgment must be open to renewal as more and more lessons are learned. Um, this was the attitude at the end of the Vatican Council in 1965. Yes. There's a document on mission, traditional missionary activity, but it talks about dialogue because the council had also issued a text on interreligious dialogue and ecumenical dialogue and so forth. And so, okay, these are out there. Now let's see what works. Let's, let's learn from experience and see how the experiences in dialogue may influence our understanding of mission and how our understanding of mission may influence how we understand interreligious dialogue. Um, but despite the fact that Dominus Jesus also took a toll on ecumenical relations between the Catholic Church leaders and leaders of other Christian churches in its restatement in 2000 of a, of a position original to 1964, as those 36 years of intense theological dialogue between Christians had made little difference. And that in conjunction with Dominus Jesus was the investigation of a book by the Jesuit scholar Jacques Dupuy toward a Christian theology of religious pluralism. Despite the fact that Dominus Jesus caused wreckage in ecumenical relations. I remember the Archbishop of Canterbury said, you would think after 36 years of dialogue we would be considered a proper church, you know? <laughs> and the Jacques Dupuy story, and he was being investigated, and in fact he didn't have to change anything in his book, but it did show that there was a serious concern with coming up with a theology of pluralism, that there are pluralism of ways to God. And he argued that in a certain degree there is a kind of pluralism, but at the same time understanding, you know, the principles of Christian theology. So it, that was going on. But despite that, what's really come to the fore since Dominus Jesus in 2000 is what's been going on in Jewish relations. Now, when the Dominus Jesus came out, you know, as often happens, people at the Jewish agencies get these texts before the rest of us and they read right through them and to see what, where does this impact. Well, they weren't in there. They weren't in there, you know. And so I know, I know what, like, for example, when the Pope published Crossing the Threshold of Pope, my colleague Eugene Fisher in Jewish Relations got a copy right away and read through it, you know, just in case there was something in there that would negatively impact Jewish relations. He'd hear about it from Jewish agencies very fast and he wanted to know what it said, and start testing it out. He brought the book and slammed it on my desk in 1995, and he said, no problems for me, but you got problems. <laughs> and sure enough, yes, there was the negative soteriology of Buddhism, his comment, and then something about Islam, too. And, um, but the Jews were not in Dominus Jesus, and so they asked, where are we? Why are just Dominus Jesus on the universality of salvation in Jesus Christ not mention us? Is it because the covenant remains so much intact that we're not part of this discussion? That the fact that we, we do have faith and revelation, we have faith in the one God and revelation that we get by, why are we not here? And it's in reply to that that we've gone through a series of developments. And I think that's where the discussion is really focused now because if in fact if in fact the position can be argued 
that the covenant with the Jews remains intact and is salvific as is, then it opens the door to the questions of religious pluralism. I think it really is the linchpin. Now, if you read the Metro section last Sunday, Saturday, and check the religion page, you will note how truly current this topic is. Because there was an article there, Catechism Edit, Troubling, Jewish Leaders Say. And this was a religion news service story by Daniel Burke. The article reports that, that how, reports how U.S. bishops at their June meeting this year had changed a, had discussed a change in the 2006 U.S. Catholic Catechism for Adults. The matter was discussed in executive session. I can't recall in my 16 years where something up for a vote like this that had public impact was discussed in executive session. So that in itself raises suspicions. What's being talked about with the press and observers not there behind the closed doors with the bishops? Because most of their sessions are public sessions. Such, uh, the, the action involved three committees of the bishops, the Education Committee, the Doctrine Committee, and the Ecumenical and Interreligious Affairs Committee that I used to work for. Archbishop Donald Worrell, who chairs the board that oversaw the new catechism that was voted on and approved in 2006, is quoted in the article as saying, there was a concern that we were trying to say too much in a few words. And when you get into an area of theological complexity, brevity doesn't always serve you well. Well, is the catechism a place to iron out a theological complex question? because the catechism is to be brief and to the point. The original sentence in the U.S. catechism was, thus the covenant that God made with the Jewish people through Moses remains eternally valid for them. This was changed to, to the Jewish people whom God first chose to hear his word belong the sonship, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship and the promises, to them belong the patriarchs and of their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ. Now, most of that is a quote from Paul's letter to the Romans 9, 4 to 5. I think Abraham Foxman, national director of the ADL, Anti-Defamation League, summed it up pretty well. Why take a very simple sentence and replace it with a very complicated paragraph? <laughs> Professor Alan Berger, who teaches Holocaust studies at Florida Atlantic University, said that this change is the latest in a long line of mixed symbols. It's very troubling. So, does this mean that the U.S. bishops think we should pull back from this statement? Or is it a, was it a catechetical point? Was it a doctrinal point? The fact that it was discussed behind executive session what's going on. Catechetically, I can see the argument and you let it go, but the problem was certain talking points that were handed out to the bishops during executive session were also reported on and some of the talking points were a bit troubling. There was not enough, there were not enough bishops present in June uh, for a final vote and that had to be taken by mail and in the end 231 bishops voted for the change and 14 against it and one abstained, and this was announced August 5th. In some reflections about the change, the question was raised, if it is accurate Catholic teaching to say that any of the covenants that God has with the Jews imparts salvation apart from the mediation of Christ. Now, always unfolding, always looking to what's happening right on the edge. Let me circulate these around. Just last Friday, during his pastoral visit to France, Benedict the Sixteenth spoke to Jews. And this is it. It's a very brief message at the Elysee Palace. Mm -hmm. 
so three paragraphs. Um, by her very nature, the Catholic Church feels obliged to respect the covenant made by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Indeed, the church herself is situated within the eternal covenant of the Almighty. So is he reiterating, no, we believe this covenant is eternal, whose plans are immutable, and she respects the children of the promise as children of the covenant, as her beloved brothers and sisters in the faith. This was his meeting with representatives just last Friday. So the story is unfolding right in front of our eyes. In many ways, this, um, these three paragraphs summarize very much the uh, horizon, I think, in Catholic-Jewish relations at this particular time. There's a lot compacted in here because he praises the, the Shabbat, he talks about how Jesus himself, you know, was a Jew and prayed as a Jew and recited the Psalms, who listened to the word on the Sabbath, uh, and so forth, and then quotes the Talmud, which is always good. The Sabbath is offered to you, but you are not offered to the Sabbath. And then he has this curious sentence in that first paragraph, Christ has asked the people of the covenant to recognize always the unprecedented greatness and love of the creator for all humanity. Okay. And then he says, dear friends, that which unites us and that which separates us, we share a relationship that should be strengthened and lived. And we know that these fraternal bonds constitute a continued invitation. Then the, the, the position that I read, um, and uh, he's, he talks about we are all spiritual Semites. This was a quote from Pius XI, Pius XI who was preparing to write an encyclical on the relation with the Jews, but never got around to it with developments taking place in Europe. Uh, then quoting uh, Henri de Lubac and able to mention Pius XII in all of this, and talks about, you know, to be anti-Semitic also signifies being anti-Christian and so forth. And so being able to talk about that, and then, uh, then he says, I cannot neglect on this occasion to recall the eminent role played by the Jews of France in the building up of the whole nation of their prestigious contribution to her spiritual patrimony. So the contribution of Jews to the state, to, the, to France, they continue to give great figures to the spheres of politics, cultures, and arts, and so forth. So it's, it sh sort of shows you, you know, in a, in a nutshell, where we are in terms, I think, um, in Christian, Jewish, Catholic Jewish relations. We're at a point, I think, of combing through the addresses of Benedict XVI to Muslims, to Jews, to other Christians, and to many others to measure what he may be attempting to correct from the time of Vatican II. Um, and um, on his same visit to France, he also visited, uh, he also spoke to the Catholic bishops of France. Now that text exists in um, Spanish, Italian, and French on the website, but the English is not. I've got a kind of first run, so they, they may not be pleased with the way the English translation reads. But it's curious, um, this was report, it's how it's reported too. This was reported by Catholic News Service that, oh, and towards the end of his talk, regarding the dialogue with Muslims, he said this dialogue should always be it's important that this dialogue should focus on the truth. But in fact, he says a lot more than that. He talks about John the 23rd, who had been nuncio to Paris, and of Paul the Sixth, and how they set up secretariats for Christian unity and secretariats for interreligious relations. And these, these structures in 1988 were, were made pontifical councils. But soon after they were formed in, in the 60s, 10 years to be exact, there were commissions for religious relations with Jews and religious relations with Muslims. So he's talking about all sets of relations here, ecumenical, Jewish, and Muslims. And then he says, these structures in some sense constitute the institutional and conciliar recognition of countless earlier initi initiatives and accomplishments. It's this word countless. Um, 
And we're not sure if he's talking about at the time of Vatican II, were there countless initiatives, or 10 years after when the commissions were. You couldn't really call them countless. Yes, there were many things happening in ecumenism already, and the Catholic Church came on board, and that was a stated goal. There were only some things happening in Jewish relations, rather important developments, but it was, it was, this was something new, the statement on the Jews, as well as the embracing of the ecumenical movement. And the whole statement on interreligious, there were, was very little. Yes, you could go back in the missionary history and point out some of those great missionaries who went into cultures and enculturated the gospel, and, and uh, Matteo Ricci, you know, writing a text in Confucian style, pointing out to the Confucians that there's a theism that they have neglected or Robert De Nobili writing a text in Indian languages following that style, showing that there's been an incarnation of God and Jesus and so forth. So you can find, and then you can see the missionaries beginning to ask the question, how can we say that these people are denied salvation because we see so many workings of the Spirit among them? So you have a buildup, but it, and it was there, but it, it would be hard to call it countless. And yet Benedict has tried to emphasize, and one of his corrections is, too many people have talked about Vatican II as radical change from the past. Well, it's true. We were not fully engaged in the, we were not engaged in the ecumenical movement before Vatican II. We did not have a positive statement on the relation of the church to the Jews or a positive statement on Islam or Muslims. And we had never encouraged <clears throat> Christians to engage in dialogue. Those are new. But he says the hermeneutics of change has dominated and there's a hermeneutic of continuity that's stronger. So he's tried to argue that we really haven't changed that much from our past views. You know, the old joke, you know, when a big change comes out is the church has always believed, you know. Um, so um, he then goes on to say, yes, the Catholic Church has promoted bilateral dialogue, two-sided dialogue, wherever it's gone. Lutherans for Christian unity, Muslims for, for the goals of that Jewish Catholic. And the, the ultimate goal of these dialogues, ecumenical for Christian unity and irreligious dialogue, is to seek and deepen a knowledge of the truth. The building of bridges between great ecclesial Christian traditions and dialogue with other religious traditions demand a real striving for mutual understanding. Okay, we agree. Ignorance is bad. We need to understand. Only the truth makes it possible to live authentically the dual commandment of love. I find that interesting, that reference to the dual commandment of love. It's because Muslims have used the dual commandment of love as a basis for theological dialogue a year ago at this time in the text, A Common Word. And now people are kind of taking note of that. One must follow closely the various initiatives that are undertaken, he tells the bishops, so as to discern which ones favor reciprocal knowledge and respect, as well as the promotion of dialogue, as well as to avoid those which lead to impasses. So we're to avoid dialogues that lead to impasses. What is he talking about here? <laughs> what is he talking about? Goodwill is not enough. I believe it is good to begin by listening, oh good, then moving on to theological discussion so as to arrive finally at witness and proclamation of the faith. Ah, so there's our topic. Listen, dialogue, then you arrive at proclamation of the faith. Proclamation. And he quotes St. Paul here, and then he said, the globalized, multicultural, multi-religious society in which we live is a God-given opportunity to proclaim truth and practice love so as to reach out to every human being without distinction, even beyond the limits of the visible church. So it's right there at the heart in terms of, is he, what's the role of proclamation in dialogue? One must begin somewhere. And as I've said, we go back to Vatican II, 62 to 65. Yes, and so we have these, you know, the Catholic Church entering into ecumenical dialogue, opening up its understanding of the church, that the church is not just contiguous to the Roman Catholic Church of elements of sanctification and truth 
in other Christian communities. Um, and then the, the opening up of relations with the Jews and opening up of interreligious dialogue. Dialogue was a major term. You don't find it. You, you, you search the indices of all the previous general councils of the Western Church, and dialogue was not used. Um, Paul VI brought the term in in a large way, halfway through the council with his encyclical on the church. He uses the word dialogue 71 times. The Latinists were very upset because it was a neologism, dialogos, you know, so they didn't like it. But he used it. And he talked about God has engaged all of humanity in the dialogue of salvation. So that was the context for talking about what the church is and that we ourselves are in dialogue with God and ourselves in this dialogue of salvation. But then he talked about the dialogue with other Christians as we expand our understanding of church, the dialogue with the Jews, the dialogue with those who believe in the one God, first among whom were the Muslims, the dialogue with other believers, the dialogue with non-believers. That was his blueprint that he gave us, and he, he introduced that word. And so it's all through the decree on ecumenism among Christians, you know. And what drives us, of course, in Christian unity is our understanding that it is a scandal to the gospel that we're divided because Christ prayed on the night before he died, John 17, 21, that we may all be one as you and I are one, Father, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe our disunity harms our mission so that the world will believe. And so you understand mission and proclamation, we should be missionizing one another, Christians, with the gospel because we both receive the gospel and we proclaim it to one another. In fact, we share the gospel. It's a great breakthrough. I remember RCI IA program, Rite of Christian Initiation for Adults over here at Holy Trinity, and to the candidates, to the other Christians who were in this to become Catholics, they gave them Bibles at one point and said, receive the word of God. And I pulled the liturgy director aside and I said, what do you think they've been reading up to this time? You know, think about this, you know. So, I mean, we were, we were all thumbs trying to put all this into action after Vatican II, you know. But, um, but then when it comes to Jews and to Muslims, what is the role of proclamation, of proclamation of the gospel? in these bilateral dialogues. And of course we had to learn this. We had to see where it went. Ten years after Vatican II, Paul the Sixth, well I also should tell you that the, the, the text on missionary activity also talks about dialogue and that's rather important. So missionaries are urged to associate with other people among whom they are sent and by sincere and patient dialogue, they come to know what riches a generous God has distributed to the nations. That's an extraordinary statement. That this is not all ignorance, this is not all the work of the devil. You know, this, this was, this was, at the same time they are told to illustrate these riches with the light of the gospels to set them free and to restore them to the dominion of God the Savior. Students in seminaries preparing for missionary work should be formed for dialogue with non-Christians. You know, some places implemented that, some places didn't. Paul VI, 10 years after Vatican II, uh, at the close of a special synod of bishops, and that was a structure that came out of Vatican II, the synod of bishops, to promote collegiality. Although uh, John O'Malley tells us in his book, his recent book on what happened at Vatican II, that collegiality unfortunately remained more of an abstract idea than an implemented, implemented way of acting. Nevertheless, in the mid-70s, there was a synod of bishops on evangelization. And then as happens, as after there's a synod, then the Pope issues a text, which is the close of the synod, and he, he issued a, an exhortation uh, announcing the gospel, uh, Evangelii Nunciandi. And in it, he gives several definitions of evangelization. It's the proclamation of Christ, our Lord, to those who do not know him in preaching and catechesis, baptism, and the administration of other sacraments. So that's one meaning of evangelization. Another meaning, the church appreciates that evangelization means the carrying forth of the good news 
to every sector of the human race so that by its strength it may enter into the hearts of men and renew the human race. That it wasn't just a matter of going among peoples to make them Christians, but going with the gospel among people so that societies are renewed. So that through dialogue and through the dialogue plays a, a role in renewal of people. And so suddenly we had many definitions of evangelization floating. We were still back and forth. What are you going to emphasize? And interesting, John Paul II, 1980, went to Africa. I still remember this. And it's announced, I want to go to Africa. It's a big missionary journey he made, 1980, just, you know, second year after he's elected. I'm going for the sake of evangelization, and I want to dialogue with the leaders of other religions. Well, the leaders of other religions sort of wondered, you want to dialogue too? Well, you're coming to evangelize. And so trying always to balance this. But he had such a positive character to him. He was genuinely interested in people and listened and interacted that he really began to win the hearts of religious leaders. They began to let down their goal, that he was really serious, I guess, about this thing, dialogue. In spite of all this other evangelization stuff, you know, this man was serious about hearing what we had to say. After, you know, now we're talking 14 years experience, the office responsible for interreligious dialogue, in those days it was still called the Secretariat for Non-Christians, issued a text, the attitude of the church towards the followers of other religions. Reflections and Orientations on Dialogue and Mission. This was issued in 1984. It was an extraordinary text in that it really talked about how uh, evangelizing mission of the church is not a single but a complex reality. It involves many elements, many elements, the presence and witness, just being present and witnessing among people. Yeah, we found with Protestants, witness is a lot more active term than it is for Catholics. Witness means you're just there being present. I think of Matteo Ricci witnessing, but no, Isaac Joes was a witness in the Protestant world. It means going out and standing up and being struck down by a tomahawk. You know, that's the witness. You know, so it was interesting. Even these words that we seek among Christians to try to explain variations of this practice have different different meanings. Um, this was issued in 1984, and it, uh, in many ways I, I found it uh, um, a very uplifting document. And they handed it in in 1984, having finished it and voted on it. And John Paul II said, okay, I like it, now I want you to do it all again. I want you to rewrite it, but I want you to consult to the, with the other office here, the Congregation for Evangelization of Peoples. And so they sat down with the office. It used to be Propaganda of the Faith, uh, the faith Propagation of the Faith, the, the, the office responsible for missionary activity. Because the head of that was constantly saying, all these theologians that are writing about dialogue, they're saying... Mission's been replaced by dialogue. That's not true. We still, you know, we don't just dialogue with people. We go out there, you know, and do the traditional thing. So this, this struggle back and forth. So from 84 to 91, they worked on a text. It was entitled Dialogue and Proclamation. And I asked Michael Fitzgerald, who was secretary at the time of the Office for Interreligious Dialogue, how did you do? He said he had one consultant, Jacques Dupuy, mm -hmm. and... They had two people on the evangelization side, and we hammered out every sentence. We slugged it out because this, you know, back and forth, back and forth. But when they were finished with it, by then, John Paul II had changed the curia, and he made these secretariats that had sprung up at the time of Vatican II into pontifical councils, and he made them report to congregations. So if a pontifical council wanted to issue a text, it had to report its text to a congregation that would touch upon it, which meant doctrine of the faith, which meant that they were the third Roman office involved in this, and they weighed in on changes too. They were ready to issue it at the end of 1990, and they were told, oh no, you can't issue it because the Pope is about ready to send out an encyclical on mission. So while these people were hammering out a text on dialogue and proclamation, there was a team writing an encyclical on mission 
<laughs> in parallel. Same thing going on at the council. Um, John Paul, and, and it was due to come out in December to 1990, and um, that would have been the 25th anniversary of the text of Vatican II on mission, Agentes. But they waited to release it, though it's dated December 1990, they waited to release it in January of 91. <laughs> and interestingly, it, they announced it and made it public the day the Allies began the air war against Iraq and the first <laughs> Iraq war. So we were meeting with Jews and Muslims in, in St. Louis at Washington University talking about our various doctrines of just war. And the Vatican had issued a text on missionary activity, you know, and of course, just on the news of it, the Muslims are saying, this isn't good. You know, a coalition of nations are attacking a Muslim land and now you're doing the missionary thing. So, but it came out, what was extraordinary about the Pope's encyclical on mission, it was John Paul II. It was his, yeah, okay, we never gave up traditional missionary activity and dialogue doesn't replace it, but let me tell you, Religions are very significant because it's the way God has spoken to countless people. So he elevated, I think, the teaching on interreligious dialogue. And he talked about the role of the Holy Spirit. It's one of his best sources on the spirit active among all peoples. And he talked about, you know, I brought everybody together in Assisi in 86 to fast and to walk together and to pray. And there we all were lined up, you know, in the piazza. You know, and I had next to me the representatives of Constantinople and the other Orthodox churches and the Archbishop of Canterbury and all around the various Protestants and the Rabbi of Rome right there at the end. And here were Buddhists and Muslims and Hindus. They didn't put the Muslims next to me, they put the Buddhists because it's the Dalai Lama. And all the way around to two Crow Indians, you know. And, and, we, and, and, and the picture's worth a thousand words, you know. And he said, you know what we learned that day? that every prayer is called forth by the Holy Spirit. You know, we learned that all of us are motivated by God in our religious activity. So, you know, he was giving all of this positive endorsement to dialogue and the value of other religions, at the same time, re-endorsing and criticizing various views of missionary activity uh, that talked about, well, we're all building the kingdom of God together, so other religions in their own ways are built. No, 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 that's not exactly what we mean by this. You cannot reduce this to kingdom theology, that the, there's a role for the church and everything. So you had that going on. Then, six months later, Dialogue and Proclamation came out. And um, um, it was, um, it, it reiterated, you know, that we bring the good news into all areas of humanity and through its impact, transform that humanity from within. It reiterated that, it talked about fourfold dialogue, you know, of life and of collaboration and of theological dialogue uh, and of uh, religious experience. It tried to draw in the experience that consultors and others have had. And our, we were consulted here in the U.S. and we gave responses to the various drafts. Mm. Ways that what we have learned from dialoguing with our partners, our religious partners. And it has this extraordinary sentence Dialogue does not merely aim at mutual understanding. It reaches a deeper level. This is paragraph 40, that of the spirit, where under God's influence, we share our deepest teachings and beliefs with one another. You know, it's extraordinary, extraordinary kind of picture of what's going on in interreligious dialogue because we're talking about relationships. Um, under John Paul II, Interreligious dialogue remained important. It could have died on the vine. I really think it could have. But the fact that he, he had his Assisi events, and there were three of them, he went places, he met with people, he touched people, especially Jews, especially Jews. In 1980, he went to Mons in Germany, and he said, the first dimension of this dialogue, that is, the meeting between the people of God of the Old Covenant, never, revoke, never revoked by God. So this was the key passage that people often say. He says the covenant was never revoked by God. And that of the New Covenant is that at the same time, a dialogue within our church, that is to say, between the first and second parts of the Bible. Um, Jews felt very comfortable that he really understood through his Holocaust experience, his friendship with, 
with Jews as a child and so forth. Everyone and the outpouring at his death. Why this has resurfaced is because the man whose office produced Dominus Jesus is now the Pope. And after he was elected, he began making a distinction almost immediately between the theological dialogue among Christians. Okay. And he, he really liked Lutheran Catholic dialogue. I mean, as a German, he thought. <laughs> and, he, and he was instrumental in the justification by faith agreement finally getting passed by dealing with, you know, there's still a lot of inertia in the Catholic Church regarding ecumenism itself. And so he was able in his own sort of way to manage that. But when it came to a religious dialogue, he would not just say theological, and he coupled it with intercultural dialogue. And then certain moves and things happened. Um, um, meanwhile, um, taking the teaching of John Paul II, uh, Cardinal Cosper, uh, gave a talk which came out, was eventually published in America as the good olive tree and talked about the two peoples and how the wild olive shoot, this image from the New Testament, grafted onto the, to the stock of Israel, became the church and everything, and um, the special relationship. So those working in the field of Catholic-Jewish relations, Catholics and Jews, produced a text, Reflections on Covenant and Mission, that came out of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops and the National Council of Synagogues. The news, the, the media office gave it the headline, Jews and, and Catholics agree there's no mission to the Jews. And it immediately caused a huge reaction. The chair of the doctrine committee said, who are you to say there's no mission to the Jews? And um, uh, Cardinal Dulles writes an article in America covenant and mission and takes it on and says we have a mission to everyone including the Jews. Even this language, mission to the Jews, is a peculiar language. I don't think we have much history of that. Yes, you'll find it in certain evangelical circles, but you won't find it in Catholic circles. But the phrase itself, now the, the reflections on covenant and mission said nothing more than what Cardinal Cosper, who headed the office for the Commission for Relations with the Jews had said in his earlier article. But it was the twist on the use of the word mission that became an issue. And of course, to Jews, so many negative understandings of mission about how they were forced to, to, to endure long lectures on Christianity and so forth, all of this stuff, having gone through the Holocaust and everything else. So um, this led to uh, some of the scholars responding to Cardinal Dulles saying, what you say is true, but Nostra Aetate has come out and said, Paul's letter to the Romans is the lens through which we read Jewish Christ Catholic relations. And there Paul struggled with the two, and, he, and it's that line, to them belong the covenants and the, and the patriarchs and all of this, you know. So tradition, and this has been our tradition, this has been our development since Vatican II, tradition trumps scripture. <laughs> on this, you know. This is our teaching. And then, you know, meanwhile, um, uh, well, so the discussion's launched. And uh, people are always looking for signs. Um, one of the corrections that Benedict wanted to bring in was to allow a more use of the Latin Mass. And he was always a little more open to those reactionaries who got very close to breaking away, and some did, over the whole Latin Mass business. And so he restored the use of the Latin Mass using the 1962 Missal. We're talking about a small number of people. Most Masses use the 1970 Missal that incorporates the language of Vatican II. The 1962 Missal, though it no longer has the word perfidious in front of Jews and save them from their perf perf perfidy, and it looked like Pius XII himself wanted to remove that from his notes, but he, he didn't. John XXIII had that removed officially in his first Good Friday, the prayer for the Jews. He stopped the Good Friday service. This was all, of course, he told the Master of Ceremonies he's going to do this. 
And then they announced the Holy Father has asked that these words be removed from the prayer. And so it became the practice, so that was removed. But it still had references to the blindness of the Jews and to the conversion of the Jews. And so Benedict rewrote that prayer. So yes, you can use the 62 Missal, but now we gotta change this one prayer. And there's other things too. And it came out just before Easter, so those using the Latin Missal had to use it. Well, unfortunately, it still had the heading for the conversion of the Jews. And it says, let us also pray for the Jews. May the Lord our God enlighten their hearts so that they may acknowledge Jesus Christ, the Savior of all men. Jews did not like that. And they said, are you, are you backing away or are you not backing away? Um, and so that led to those comments. And then, of course, we have the incident with the catechism um, that... I just began this talk with. I really think that um, on the Catholic side, we really need to bring our scripture people and our theologians together and reflect together on where exactly is our teaching. I think this is the linchpin issue right now. And we need, it's a, I, perhaps so, perhaps. Um, you cannot solve this by two sentences in the catechism but removing one that says that the covenant remains intact which is a little different from the words of John Paul II in Mons and inserting a passage from Paul which has all the ambiguity of his own reflection on this relationship did not help um, and at the same time Benedict now is saying Dialogue should be focused on the truth. This was his message last spring when he met with Jews and Muslims and some others here in Washington, D.C. My understanding was that, as I read it, was that he's really restoring interreligious dialogue, what it was, to where it was three years earlier when he began as pope. But when he began as pope, he really tried to de-emphasize it. He moved a specialist on Islam out from heading the office for interreligious dialogue to be nuncio in, in Cairo and did not replace him and then puts an elderly man in who also handled the office on culture. And then finally, after the Regensburg speech and other incidents, they announced we're gonna restore the office on interreligious dialogue. Well, they never officially announced they were gonna get rid of it. But they, so, and they put Cardinal Turan in so it's there. And now we're talking about the dialogue of truth. We always talked about that, that we're dialoguing because we're trying to share with one another our understanding of the truth. You know? But I'm afraid that many people have set up a kind of straw man. Interreligious dialogue is anything goes, and uh, it's an occasion when you relativize the truth and people lose their faith. Well, my understanding is just the opposite. I've never known anybody to have lost their faith in dialogue. I always see it strengthened. In conversation with others, you grow, you have to articulate your faith in a way that's understandable and that's distinctly Christian in comparison or in contrast to what another is saying. I've seen growth in understanding. Um, it's a long, hard process after all this his history of missionary, pro uh, missionary activity to get partners who really trust us that dialogue is the way to go. So it's taken 30 years for Muslims and Buddhists and Hindus to say, okay, let's finally do it. And then Muslims say, let's dialogue theologically on, a, on love of God and love of, of neighbor. And at this point, the Vatican's at a point, well, we can't do theological dialogue because you're not flexible in your understanding of revelation. You know, it's, we, we've... Uh, We've kind of reversed. Yeah, I got it. I'm trying to, to bring this to a conclusion. Um, so I, I, I think my conclusion as I'm working through this year, because this is only kind of setting up where I see the issue, the, the conclusion is the Catholic Theological Society of America is meeting in June, and its theme is impasses and beyond. Well, I think we have an impasse here. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you.
Dave and Mercedes and John's comments invite dialogue with John. There may be some more dessert out there, I suspect. If there is, please help yourself to it if you wish. Have a drink. And before we have a conversation, I want to thank the people from the Delta Center, particularly Amanda Gann, uh, who's here, who organized this, and I think Melody Box Hockman, too. Thank you. All right, John, now you're on. Good. Starting right here. John. Uh, whereas a lot of this stuff gets sent into. Uh, it's what I see is a tension between understanding dialogue as relationships, or emphasizing that dialogue is, is really relationship, or purity of doctrine, getting the purity of doctrine. I, I see these as competing motives. Or it's where a change in self understanding. Yeah. I mean, Jesus' self understanding changed because he listened. I don't think there's any point in going into a dialogue unless the, the parties are interested or open to changing in their self-understanding. Mm -hmm. what the, what's the point of it otherwise? Mm -hmm. That's right. I, I think you're right. I think part of the problem is that when you try to put this in the area of teaching and you try to talk about the lessons learned from relationships, there are all sorts of people that react to that and are suddenly fearful that this is going to somehow impact the purity of our doctrine. Um, Cardinal Dulles's reaction to reflections on covenant and mission. You know, I think that's what's reflected in there. Although, you know, I, I don't want to completely dismiss it. He made some very good theological points, and perhaps the people that prepared covenant and mission should have been a little more accurate in some of their reflections. But it seems that what's going on here is dialogue is about relationships, and especially that paragraph 40 in Dialogue and Proclamation, that the, the point is not just mutual understanding. The point is this experience of one another as believers and the sharing of our faith with one another. And it's that level that we really encounter the Spirit working among us. That's what it's about, you know. Um, so... On the other table. So I really appreciated your presentation a great deal. Um, my question is, if, if you're in an interreligious dialogue and with a rabbi and an imam, let's say, and they pose to you, are Jews and Muslims responding? Right, that's an easy one. <laughs> Excuse me? That's an easy one. Okay. They're not, I mean, and Vatican II was clear on that too. So, I mean, in other words, it, Conversion is not required for salvation. Can you say more? Because I don't, yeah. I don't know why it's not. If, if the only way to get to heaven is through accepting Jesus into your life, how can what you just said be the case? Um, well, the only way to heaven is, um, is uh, that's not a teaching if you understand accepting Jesus into your life as actively accepting Jesus into your life. Um, so even, I think, Agentes makes clear, uh, you know, people are, uh, though many are saved who in particular ways uh, do not accept Jesus or not, you know, through no fault of their own, they talk about this. This, in fact, was the, uh, one of the things of, before Vatican II with Father Feeney, even regarding, you even had to be a Catholic to be saved. So this was applied to other Christians. And he was saying, no, that's not the case. That there was, there was, it was beginning to work its way into Catholic understanding that um, uh, salvation, you know, salvation was available to all. And uh, taking the, the line from the letter to Timothy, God wills the salvation of all. And for many, that's just not possible by be becoming Christian. You know, that it's not possible to become Christians. So, well, forgive me for trying to tease that out a little bit more. If you're if you're um, a committed Muslim who believes in the revelation of the Prophet Muhammad, um, if you're Jewish and you're still waiting for their Messiah, if, in those two cases, can do those people? Do those people of those religions um, 
can they be saved? Yes, they can. They stick with that with their religions, and they don't and they don't uh, relate to Jesus Christ. Yeah, they can, because that's a, that's a, that's an unorthodox view uh, from my from my study. Which in in the in Catholic teaching? No, I don't know Catholic teaching. Okay. But that's that's the case with Catholic teaching that. Yeah, uh, you you can easy enough to find Christians who would believe what you have said. But the locus of mine is on Catholic teaching. The way I understand the, the official Catholic teaching is that there's the Jesus of history, and then there's the Jesus Christ of the Trinity. And so people can deny the Jesus of history, but still have access to the fullness of salvation through the working of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Even so if that you so remain that, in that's, one of those other two religions. That's right. So Jesus Christ is at work. Is that right, John? He, well, yeah, and you could say in this way that God, God has been active through creation by means of word, by means of, of revelation and understanding, by means of the spirit, by moving people, uh, uh, moving people to, to God, and that these ways of acting in history did not cease with the incarnation of Jesus Christ, that the incarnation of Jesus embodied this, but that these ways of acting among peoples did not cease. Now, yes, you can find times when, you know, the great motivation to the Jesuit missionaries who came over here in the 17th century to endure enormous hardships was that they had to get the gospel preached because these people were in jeopardy. You know, that there was this understanding, but you can see a development in the Catholic reflection on this, in spite of the fact that you can find conciliar teaching that says unless you accept the Pope, you know, as the supreme pontiff on earth, let you you'll be anathema, you know, be excommunicated. Yet you can see a development in teaching that there's uh, on this in terms of Catholic teaching. Um, an old book by... Uh, old now, Francis Sullivan, Salvation Outside the Church, where he traces the history of this uh, doctrine. I'll just say, my, my final comment, 